You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. And now, here's two guys who will spend the entire summer following Taylor Swift on tour, Evan and Joe. I'm Joe Tykotsky down in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm Evan McFarland here in what I thought to believe was New Brunswick, but it uh, is a lot colder than it usually is this time of year. <laughs> You're watching episode 55 of Mick and T Sports Report. And by the looks of this t-shirt, along with the lighter in my hand, as well as the depressed look on Evan's face, that can only mean one thing. After an exciting Leafs round one win in the Stanley Cup playoffs, the dream has died in a five-game loss to the Panthers. What happened, Evan? Uh, it's, it's, it's usually a reality check for what time of year it is for me. So even though it is cold out, I realize it is spring because the Leafs are not playing hockey anymore. Yeah. I don't know, man. I Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got a lot to get to here. We have two great interviews on this episode and we'll start out right after this short break with one of the more special guests we've ever had in the show, so stay tuned. You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV in St. Andrews. Welcome back to Mick and T Sports Report here on CHCO. Our first guest is Peyton Hamilton, a grade 12 high school student at Sir James Dunn Academy here in St. Andrews. Just nine weeks after being born, Peyton was diagnosed with a condition that caused liver disease, and she received a liver transplant from her father, Andy. She's required to take an anti-rejection medication to keep her liver growing healthy, and as a result, is immunocompromised. Peyton had a swollen lymph node a few years ago, but was monitored regularly, and her overall health was excellent, playing and starring in basketball for her school team. But during the summer of 2022, she became increasingly tired and was low on energy to the point of passing out. Numerous tests, scans, and multiple biopsies led to a diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma for Peyton a cancer that affects just over 1,000 Canadians each year. On a personal note, I've known Peyton since she was in seventh grade, and she has fought this cancer the way she approaches everything with a huge smile on her face, regardless of how poorly she has felt. In fact, at one point, Peyton had a chemo treatment in the morning and coached a middle school basketball game later that day. So let's take a few minutes to meet a truly special young woman Peyton Hamilton. Peyton, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. All right. You told me you'd moved to St. Andrews at age four with the intention of just a two-year stay that's now turned into 14 years. So like, did you say to your dad, we're only staying two years or how did it turn into the 14? Originally, my dad got a job here as the bank manager and it was initial for two years to stay. And then I think we just kind of got wrapped up with the community and everyone here. And it's a great spot to grow up because it's such a small again, area where you're about roaming the streets by the time you're eight <laughs> by yeah. yourself. So it ended up, yeah, two years. And there was kind of some back and forth of whether we were going to leave or not. And then COVID hit. So then now I'm graduating from here. So it's been 14, 14 fun years. That's good stuff. Now, you were always very active and sports oriented. Um, since you've been at SJDA, what sports have you played? I did, I did mostly everything. I did cross country and track and all the running ones, volleyball, soccer, and then basketball was the consistent one where I guess I played varsity girls and boys. That's, uh, that's good to put on your resume. Um, how <laughs> old were you when you started basketball? I know that's your favorite sport. <laughs> I was four. Um, I actually wasn't that interested in playing it originally. My dad kind of got put in as the coach. And then I used to run around with my arms in my jersey. So no one would pass me the ball because I didn't want to be there. <laughs> that's, that's so, a, which is, that's yeah, which is funny now because it just kind of, I guess, developed throughout and then finished off my high school years kind of with my dad involved and both my brothers. So it's always been kind of like a family thing, which made it fun on top of the game. Yeah, yeah. 
I would have liked to tell some girls to put their hands in the shirt so no one passed them the ball. But Evan, you have I a probably question? need it now so I don't foul people. But <laughs> yeah, I was just, I was actually just going to say there's a few on our team that we may implement that strategy next year for fouling purposes. <laughs> but uh, Peyton, just on some like some more serious stuff, like watching your last year, honestly, like from from my standpoint, it's just incredible what you've what you've gone through. So before we even ask you anything, just hats off to everything that that you've gone through, and uh, you've been an inspiration to a lot of people around here. But I've I was able to see kind of firsthand uh, the process of all this, and I know last summer you kind of started feeling extremely tired and lacked energy, and then you just you finally said, okay, that's it, let's go get some testing done. And, when the test did come back, and I mean, it's everybody's the obviously worst case to hear, but uh, with the cancer coming through, but what was your initial reaction? I know that's kind of a silly question. But. Uh, initially, I don't know. It's funny when I talk to other people because hearing them, it's like they'd be devastated, which I guess I was more so like, I wasn't really shocked. And honestly, I wasn't that upset. It was more, I guess, validating to hear that, again, I wasn't crazy. Yeah. for because as an athlete and as a person you know when your body's not performing or not functioning normally and then having that scan about eight months after when they were gonna send me off with a clean thing of health um no one really calls I guess Thursday night like no doctor is gonna call desperate to cut open your neck if it's not yeah. something serious so I mean I kind of had a feeling all along so I guess it was just kind of more that confirmation that I needed that it wasn't and once I heard when they suggested Hodgkin's out of my options and I looked into it I figured that's what it was yeah that's that's fair I mean you're talking to two guys here that have both kind of gone through the waiting <laughs> games of hearing stuff too so uh a lot to yeah. be said for just getting that weight off the shoulders when you finally hear stuff uh, but I also saw like there was days when you went for your for your treatments and then you were in the gym shooting baskets or you were coming back and going to class in the afternoon so like how much school do you think you actually missed at all? And do you think you, you didn't really fall behind in studies too much? I don't think either. No, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, there were some days where either we had practice or we had a game or I coached the middle school team too. So I wanted to go coach the yeah. game and I wasn't not going to be in the gym. And I guess that was something I was more focused on. And kind of when you get everything, I guess your life's changed and altered. It's like keeping the things that you like or that I was actually able to control present uh -huh. in my life. So I kind of, I was there consistently for the, like I'd have an appointment every week or so throughout September and October. And then November, I ended up getting my eggs removed as a precaution. And then about a week after that, I started chemo. And then from that, it kind of dropped off. And then it was like, some days I would wake up and I obviously wasn't able to like move or it was really bad or treatment wasn't great that week. So yeah. I would miss quite a bit. And then March, I was able to or February even, I think I was like, okay, I'm going to push myself a little farther. We're closer to the end to show up. So I'd say it was about three or four months. Luckily, it's such a small school that you can, like the teachers were really understanding and I was able to get everything. Plus with COVID, I guess, stuff is a lot of it is online now, uh -huh. which was set up to be able to complete stuff from a distance and then be able to go in when I could. Yeah, cool. All right, now, in regards to the basketball part of this, what was the toughest part physically about your grade 12 this past season? Physically, I think, again, kind of, you know, your capabilities and what you're able to do and you've seen it. And then when your muscle memory and you feel weak and you can't perform to that level, it's like it feels so different, like even going for a layup or a shot, like I wouldn't be able to hold my arm up or a layup I knew I was getting blocked and then I would go take a layup in a game or try to do something because I was just so much slower at getting the ball released and moving or even just catching up with people running I just felt everything it felt like you were kind of in slow motion and watching everything happen in front of you and you were like trying to keep up yeah Sam. yeah for an athlete someone that was a was and is a great player that's got to be you know uh, quite an adjustment what was the toughest part mentally about the last 10 months uh mentally I find overall it's you kind of I guess you don't really have a choice in it and that's the hardest thing I think to wrap around because having that choice is everything it's different if you choose to cut off your hair if you choose not to want to go for a run or wake up that day and move it's a little different when you can't really do that and you don't have that choice and then you're kind of expected I guess to adapt around it while everyone around you luckily I enjoyed that and I have a twin so I got to watch kind of him and I was happy that no one around me was really 
I guess, suffering through that. But mentally, it's definitely you see a kind of like what other people have or what you could have been doing. And it's just different because, again, you never got that choice. It was more so taken from you. It's not right. really what you envision for your senior year. Yeah, yeah, no. And then on top of it, throughout your high school career, COVID hits. So season gets canceled. Yeah. Then not enough girls for a girls team. So you have to pivot and move on to the boys team. So um, yeah, quite an experience. Evan. For sure. And we've been able to just kind of see you ride, ride through this. And it, it just astonishes me how mentally you were able to go through it and stay positive. And your mom comments on what I don't see. And at home, she says you're the same. And you're always just kind of keeping everybody around you so happy in the situation. I know our inside joke is we kind of had a sick sense of humor about everything, but how else did you manage to stay so positive through this process? Uh, I think again, like I was more so relieved too. I think I would have had a different reaction if it was someone like my family or my brothers going through it or even my friends or a classmate. I don't know. I just felt like I would handle it better I mean I've kind of been in the medical zone I've done with it before and I kind of just knew that it wasn't going to be it was something that I was going to be able to beat and move past it and I mean at the end of the day like things happen life isn't always fair and you get to adapt and learn from all those changes yeah well said now have you received advice or support from other cancer patients that are around your age I did. Um, originally, even just kind of before diagnosis, I was looking at TikTok and I then kind of pivoted and made an account dedicated just to posting my journey, like in the sense of, I guess, for me to be able to see it and find an outlet, but also for others. And I met all these incredible teenage girls too, who the year before previously went through all of it with Hodgkins. So you kind of find that mutual agreement. It's like, I would be scrolling through my feed and I would see a girl and she's with her hair, but you know, it's just like you and it's not your actual hair because them as well are wearing a wig. And then I had people reach out to me and say that all the videos were helpful and ask me questions and how I was going through with stuff because they just had got diagnosed. So it's kind of like a chain reaction where you kind of get to feed off other people and hear that vocal, like people vocalize and validate your experiences and then also get to share it with others to make people feel a little more less alone, yeah. I guess. Yeah, good, good, good support system. Um, and lastly, a couple things. We'll change topics a little bit. I had asked you before about if you could visit one part of Canada that you have never been to yet. You had an interesting. What was your answer? I think it'd be really cool to go to one of the territories up instead of, I guess, one of the generic provinces and see the Northern Lights. I think that would be really cool. A little bit different than the small little tourist town. We don't really get much of that up here. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and the last question, which Evan and I have been debating off camera. Um, when I was up there, I coached you in grade seven. Evan coached you later on your last couple of years. So out of these two good looking guys on the screen, which one was your favorite coach? Um, I think I have to go with the person there for both of them. I might say my dad. Your dad? What? Oh my goodness. He got, he got the best of both. He was there for girls. Uh, there for boys. Option C. <laughs> I mean, my own option. Option no, C. I'll, I'll joke aside. Your dad's, your dad's great. He certainly helped me a ton in the last few years. And uh, just on, on a more personal thing for myself, Peyton, uh, there, I've gone through some some bad days while you were going through this too. And I would come in and I'd see you come to practice and you could tell that you were grinding it out and that just make me snap out of whatever funk I had. Because if you were able to get there, then my issues weren't so big. So I, I commend you for that for 10 months. So thank you so much. Thank you. And um, and I, like I said, I met Peyton when she was younger at our camp and we're going to try to get her to work the camp this year. She played for me in grade seven and I was like grade seven on a varsity team. And she just goes out there like, no fear, no fear, which is awesome. <laughs> um, but she is Peyton Hamilton, a student at Sir James Dunn Academy will be graduating in a few weeks. What's up next year school-wise? I am going to St. Mary's University in Halifax so far, which is fun. Nice little difference of getting into a city rather than the small town and community you get used to. Excellent. Well, your story is truly one of courage, persistence, and uh, quite a heavy dose of positivity that, uh, that I think we can all learn from. And I know your parents, uh, Deb and Andy, and your 
twin brother Ben and your younger brother Owen are all quite proud of you, as is the community. Uh, keep up the good work, Peyton, and uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Well, coming up. Coming up next on Small Town Spotlight, we actually head to a place that Peyton just talked about as we go to the land of the midnight sun to talk about a long running summer music festival. And you're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. Welcome back to Mick and T Sports Report. For our 45th edition of the Small Town Spotlight segment, we head to the Northwest Territories and its capital city, Yellowknife. With a population of just over 20,000, it's the largest city in the Northwest Territories. In fact, it's the only city in the Northwest Territories. Located 400 kilometers or 250 miles south of the Arctic Circle, Yellowknife has the coldest winters of any city in Canada but it also has the sunniest spring and summer of any city in Canada. Yellowknife was the birthplace of actress Margot Kidder, as well as Dustin Milligan, who played Ted Mullins, the town vet who became romantically involved with Alexis on the TV show Schitt's Creek. And Yellowknife is also home to the music festival Folk on the Rocks, which was founded back in 1980 by Rod Russell and will be held this year on July 14th through the 16th. As the promotional materials say, come dance with us in the sand under the midnight sun. So let's meet Carly McFadden, the executive and artistic director of the festival. Carly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Now, you told me you grew up in Red Deer, Alberta, but you've lived all over Canada. Tell us some of the other parts of the country you've lived in. Yeah, um, I lived in Vancouver for quite a while, almost eight years. Um, I was in Montreal. We were just talking about that a little bit before the show started. Uh, I was there for about five years. I also lived in Pickle Lake in northern Ontario, uh, which is a very, very remote part of Ontario. It's the last stop on the road, basically, before you get to fly in communities. And um, now I'm half time in Yellowknife. Yeah. And where's the Pickle Lake is a great name. Um, yeah. Where are you the other half of the year besides Yellowknife? Uh, actually in Hamburg in Germany. So it's a little bit of a commute. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, man, that's uh, that's impressive. Now, you've been with the festival for over seven years. So as executive and artistic director of the festival, what are some of your main responsibilities? Um, I mean... The festival is obviously sort of our biggest event throughout the year, so that's the main focus. But um, additionally, you know, managing staff, all the hiring of the team, uh, taking care of volunteers, um, budgeting for the year, programming other events and activities like our artist uh, artist in residency program and main stage showdown, and um, yeah, kind of keeping things rolling year round so that when the festival time happens, it's it's nice and smooth. Good. Now, it's pretty amazing for that for a city of just over 20,000, you've been able to attract some big name performers. Hit us with some of the names of artists over the past years who have been on your stages. Yeah, um, we've had Buffy St. Marie, Gord Downey, um, Tanya Tagak, who's big in the north, the Jerry Cans, uh, City in Color. Lots of great artists have come through. It's, it's pretty incredible. It seems that a lot of folks are really curious about coming up here. So that's helpful for sure. We actually featured City in Color on one of our, we had a little music spotlight and then the YouTube people told us we couldn't put music clips on anymore. So there went that feature. Um, now this year, one of your headliners is Broken Social Scene. Um, mm -hmm. Give us a few bands that our audience may not have heard of, but that you guys are excited to to bring to the festival. Let's make sure I don't share anything we haven't announced yet. Our final lineup announcement is next Friday, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think I'm good. Uh, we have Pentayo coming up. Um, they're a group of Filipino women from Toronto who do cr traditional kulintang drumming uh, with pop sounds. It's really, really interesting. We've also got a group coming from Mexico called Buen Rostro that we're really, really excited about. Very, very high energy. Um, 
Lemon Bucket Orchestra, they've played our festival a lot. Folks love them. They've got that Balkan folk thing going on. Um, so yeah, those are some really interesting bands that maybe folks haven't heard of before that I would I would recommend checking out uh, ahead of the festival. So now do you just sort of do random research of who you'd like to invite? It's um it's kind of a combination of a few things. So we do take submissions uh, and that's the way that a lot of our artists come to us. Um, I also attend a lot of events throughout the year, like showcase festivals and other events where um, you're, you're sort of looking to book performers from those events. Uh, and then we also work with agencies as well. Um, so agents will email us saying like, so-and-so is going to be on tour, they'll be nearby. So then we sort of figure out if that makes sense for our lineup or not based on, on availability that way. Okay. Now mm -hmm. you told me you have six outdoor stages on site. Uh, mm -hmm. and things start up around noon on the Saturday and Sunday of the festival. How late into the night does the music go and how late does it stay light? Uh, it stays light almost all night. We get a little bit of a twilight hour or blue hour um, at about two or three in the morning. Uh, but we do have music going until 1 a.m. on Saturday night and normally about 1230 on Sunday night. Uh, we do also have a Friday night event that goes usually until about 2 a.m. as well. Yeah, that's now that's called Warm the Rocks. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that takes place in our beer garden on Friday night. Um, and it's just a little teaser event sort of ahead of the festival to kick things off and, and get the party going. Nice. Now, what else would we find at the festival besides the music? Uh, we have tons of great, mostly local food vendors. We do get some folks also coming up from Alberta to sell food as well, but cuisine um, from all over the world, really, really good stuff. Uh, artisan vendors from across Canada travel to the festival to sell uh, their artworks and different goods. Um, we often have live art installations. We will this year as well. Um, and lots of other activations and activities for the whole family. We have children's games and programming as well. Nice. Now, give me something food that they would sell there that I wouldn't be able to get here in Connecticut. Hmm. Uh, well, we do have usually lots of fried fish, uh, local fish from the lake. So that's kind of our specialty up here. Um, yeah, that's that's probably the one is fried fish for sure. Maybe some bannock as well. OK, what kind of fish? Uh, usually white fish, but we have trout as well. Lots of lots of great fish in the seventh deepest lake in the world. So <laughs> lots of okay. fish here. And then yeah. you mentioned bannock. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, is that a bread? It's a fried dough. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just trying to sound knowledgeable here. Um, <laughs> that's fine. It's a fried dough um, that's, yeah, uh, deep fried, sort of like something in between a biscuit and a donut. And often you eat it with butter and jam. Okay. Now, lastly, during a festival like this, three days long, do you personally ever have time to just sort of sit, relax, and enjoy some of the acts? I do usually get to watch a good amount of the acts. Um, we have a great team. Our staff runs like a well-oiled machine, I would say. So um, yeah, often I do get to check out the acts, which is uh, important just to see that the audience is responding the way we want and figure out you know, what booking could look like for the next year. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Well, she is Carly McFadden, Executive and Artistic Director of the Folk on the Rocks Music Festival, which will be held in lovely Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories, July 14th to 16th. To find out more, go to folkontherocks.com as, well as well as their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. And there's a very neat YouTube video that sort of is, shows some highlights of the festival that I watched. And it, it just sounds like a neat, a neat event um, to attend and, and be part of. Uh, and as I mentioned before, in honor of you, because your last name is McFadden, I think the festival should play some old McFadden and Whitehead tunes before the bands come on. Have you ever heard of them? Uh, yes, I have, but uh, it's been a while since anyone's brought them up, that's for sure. Um, yeah. You're right, though. It's a good suggestion. <laughs> Ain't no stopping us now, McFadden and Whitehead. Um, but yeah, anyone that's in the area, certainly we encourage to go. People that are looking for a place to go in the summer, that is just something that's sort of a bucket list type thing that you wouldn't get normally. And uh, just thanks a lot for uh, all the work you put in, and I'm sure it's appreciate it and and good luck with the festival this year thank you so much for having me and hope to see you up here sometime well welcome everybody back and that was a nice feature on the upcoming music festival in Yellowknife but uh 
Usually you do have kind of witty stuff, but Captain Obvious really wear a record store t-shirt during that interview. I did. I did wear a record store t-shirt um, from Colors Record Store in New Haven, Connecticut. It has been closed for about 11 years, but it was open 1948 to 2012. And for you kids out there, record stores are places where they used to sell these round discs and um, you probably you probably still run records as your uh, primary music source. So. <laughs> I do, I do. All right, let's get right to the shout outs, Evan. What do you have? Yeah, um, that time of year, I usually like to do the same thing. It's a pretty busy time for most seniors. I'm not even going to narrow it down to a certain school. I'm just going to say any senior in grade 12 right now going through that last wave of your high school career, uh, just enjoy the last month. It's, it's busy and it's hectic, but uh, there are moments you're going to look at back in a long time from now and you'll remember them all. So congrats to everybody. Excellent. And I've got a unique shout out to my cousin, Maury Goldberg, who lives in Lafayette, California, just outside of Oakland. And on May 29th, Maury turned 100 years old. Oh, uh, wow. That's huge. Congrats. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing man who can still probably beat me in a swimming race. So uh, happy 100th to my cousin, Maury. Congrats. I've seen you swim, but uh, I'm sure Maury is a little bit better than that anyway. <laughs> Well, that's it for episode 55 of Mick and T Sports Report. I'm Joe in New Haven. And I'm Evan here in Alaska. I'm in New Brunswick. <laughs> Thanks to Patrick Watt and Florence Mitchell for producing and editing a show that's so upbeat it could even help dry the tears from the face of a Maple Leafs fan. Oh, no. <laughs> so until next time, this is Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO-TV.